we are live now, Marianne. Um, right. I'm just waiting for a few more people to join us so we can start this session. Welcome to this month's In Conversation With series. Um, my name is Griselda Togobo, and this is a leadership podcast where I interview inspirational female leaders to share practical and simple strategies on how we women can win in the world of work. So today, I'm absolutely delighted to have Mary Ann Seagat here with us. Um, for those who don't know Marianne, she is she spent the last 20 years as a senior editor and columnist for the Sunday Times. The and Times, for actually. The Times, for the Times. Mm -hmm. She's won a large following for her columns on politics, on economics, on feminism, on parenthood and life in general. She's presented a few programs on the BBC Radio 4, as well as um, producing some documentaries. So I am particularly excited about this book because um, it's just given words and data to some of the experiences I have had as a female leader, um, as a black female leader. And I'm very excited that Marianne is joining us today to share some light on her book, The Authority Gap. So Marianne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I see you've got a proof copy, which has a different cover from, uh, from the real one. Yes, and I, lo I love this cover because it says, if you could just let me. <laughs> I talk a lot about interruptions. <laughs> yes. So can you just tell us why you decided to write this book? Well, I suppose it had been sort of nagging in the back of my head all my life, the sense that women are just treated with less respect than men. And they tend to be underestimated and patronized and talked over and their views tend to be ignored in favor of men's. And I'd sort of noticed this pattern of behavior all the way through my life. Um, but I had, I suppose I realized that in order to be taken seriously, because this is a book about how we tend to take women less seriously than men, in order to be taken seriously, I had to succeed in a man's domain first. And so I started off in financial journalism and then I moved into political journalism. And these are both traditionally quite male stereotyped fields. And though I wrote the odd column about feminism, I sort of felt I only had a license to do that because I was already taken seriously by men. And had I written this book, say, 30 years ago, I don't think a single man would have read it. I don't think it would have been reviewed in the way that it's been reviewed. Uh, and therefore, I sort of had to wait almost until the end of my journalistic career to be to have the license to write this sort of book and for men to be interested in it and to take it seriously too and not to see it as some sort of niche fluffy female feminine thing yes but but i think the important thing is that you're focusing on leadership and authority and mm. it's something that traditionally women are not seen to be um we are brought up to be very nice and agreeable and yet authority requires a certain level of assertiveness and disagreeableness to get the job done. Um, so when researching this book, what, what were some of the, the shocking stats? I mean, we all have the evidence of how life is as a, a woman working in a male dominated sector, but with, what aspect of the data really shocked you? Oh gosh, there's so many, where do I start? Okay, I suppose, uh, I had assumed when I started that once you attained a certain amount of authority as a woman, you became much more insulated from this sort of behavior that I talked about earlier, you know, being patronized and underestimated and interrupted and talked over and all that. But there was one amazing academic study of U.S. Supreme Court proceedings. And you don't get much more authoritative than being a U.S. Supreme Court justice, right? And what it found was that although women make up only a third of the justices, they suffer two thirds of all interruptions. So in other words, they're four times more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues, 96% of the time by men. Wow. So however senior you are, this sort of thing happens to you. And I think another thing, and another piece of research that I found really quite shocking and sad was that if you ask British parents to, this was another academic study, they asked parents to estimate their children's IQ and they estimated their sons on average 
to be 115, but their daughters at only 107. Despite the fact that girls develop faster than boys, have a bigger vocabulary than boys, do better at school than boys, they still thought their sons were cleverer. And therefore, the, you know, therefore boys subliminally absorb this notion that they're cleverer than girls, and girls subliminally absorb this notion that they're less clever than boys, even though their IQs are actually identical, except at the very far end of, of, of the IQ distribution. And therefore, it's no surprise, perhaps, that if you ask adult men to estimate their IQs, on average, they will estimate them at 110 and women at only 105. And yet again, their IQs are identical. And so what we're doing is we are wrongly imbuing boys and men with this notion that they are superior to girls and women. That is really shocking. Yeah, it's really shocking, isn't it? Yeah, because, you know, I have a, a son and a daughter and I cannot imagine making my daughter feel any less capable or less intelligent than my son. But then I guess when she goes out into the world, that's the messaging that she'll be getting um, because school will not be expecting that much from her simply yeah. because she, she's a girl. Well, that may be the case. I mean, I, I think these days, because girls are doing so much better than boys at school, teachers do expect them to do as well, if not better. But there's really sh there was more quite shocking research I came across about how much more boys are encouraged to speak up in the classroom compared with girls. So boys are eight times more likely to be called on to speak than girls. So boys are rewarded for speaking and girls are rewarded for being quiet and well behaved. And so girls are in effect being silenced all through their childhood, which means that they're much more reluctant on average to speak up in public later when they come to the world of work. So all academic studies show that men talk more than women in public settings. And as a result, quite often when women get evaluated by their managers for promotion, they say, oh, you know, you're not assertive enough. You don't speak up enough at meetings. You don't contribute enough. And this is probably true because that's the way they've been trained to behave. Whereas boys grow up as men with a sense of entitlement to take up the disproportionate amount of talking time. And, you know, you often hear a woman say, oh, God, did I talk too much? You never hear a man say that, do you? <laughs> and actually, yeah, yeah. well, women are often being quite rational in this because another piece of research I came across showed that women who are thought to be too talkative are penalised. So... The, the researchers had this, these two fictional CEOs. One was called John, one was called Jennifer. And the CEO was described as talking more than other people, which CEOs on the whole tend to do. If he was John, his leadership ratings went up. He was deemed to be more competent. If she was Jennifer, exactly the opposite happened. And when Jennifer was described as talking less than other people, her ratings shot up. So we sort of know subliminally, we know unconsciously that people won't like it if we talk too much. And the reason I, I do the air quotes, which I don't normally like, is because another study showed that if a woman and a man talk for exactly the same amount of time, we perceive the woman to have dominated the conversation. So even if we talk for our share, you know, our, our, our proportionate share of time at a meeting, people will think we've talked too much and they won't like it. And, and, and this is, it's so great to hear this because there's so many women themselves up one because you know I'm, I'm not i'm not talking enough why don't i ask more questions uh mm. you know I, i'm doubting myself in meetings and when i do speak i'm interrupted i'm not listened to mm. there's mansplaining going on and yeah. so the messaging going out is that our voices don't matter and yeah we have to fight to be heard and this is even worse when you add you know race into the gender mix and all the other things that go with it yeah. What can we do, um, other than beating ourselves up for not getting heard and, and not being taken seriously, what can women do to mitigate some of these, uh, some of these challenges and how can they bring men into do awareness of what they're doing? I mean, they should buy the book clearly, but what can we tell the men to do? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the important thing is there's so much research in the book that shows that this is not something that is our own personal fault. It's actually a systemic problem. So one example I give, for instance, is I'm sure you've all had this experience of saying something at a meeting, nobody takes a blind bit of notice, and the waters just close up above your head. And then 
10 minutes later, a man makes exactly the same point and it's treated like the second coming, right? And everyone says, how brilliant, what a great idea. <laughs> and we do, we beat ourselves up and we think, oh God, maybe I wasn't confident enough or maybe I wasn't articulate enough. No, you were just too female. Uh, there is this great study which took mixed sex groups of people ostensibly to take a decision about a child custody case. And they deliberately chose that subject because it's actually quite female stereotyped. And they gave the group all sorts of pieces of information about the family concerned. But they gave a few individual members a piece of information that the other members of the group didn't have. And when that piece of information was introduced by a man, it was six times more likely to be used in the group's deliberations than when it was introduced by a woman. Six times more likely. So that's a struggle we have to get ourselves heard, to be able to influence other people in a room. What can we do about it? I mean, first of all, we can call it out uh, and we can say, if someone talks over us, we know we can say, oh, could you just let me finish, please? Um, or have a word with the chair of the meeting afterwards and say, I don't know if you noticed, but that man was interrupting me and you know, I'd love you to have a quiet word with him and make sure it doesn't happen again. There is of course the danger that we will then be seen as a difficult woman or as oversensitive or paranoid or prickly. Uh, so to get around that, the best way I think is to recruit allies. So first of all, as I say, have a word with whoever chairs these meetings so that next time they'll say, oh no, hang on, I wanted to hear what Griselda was saying there. Or could you please not interrupt? Um, or, you know, if you make a point and no one takes any notice and then a man makes the same point, the chair can say, oh, I'm so glad you agreed with what Griselda said earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if the chair is someone who is not going to be very helpful, try and recruit allies who are going to be at the same meeting. So colleagues, either female or male, ideally male, because the other men will listen to a man more. Sadly, that's the point of the book. Um, but I think as women, we need to stand up for other women as well. And actually, men do that more than women do. So men are more likely to have male allies around the table who will affirm what they say than women do, which is quite interesting. Um, and you notice this even with boys at school. So if you've got a popular boy, he's likely to have sort of wingmen, you know, other boys who'll laugh at all his jokes and sort of support him. Girls don't have that to the same extent. And the same happens in adulthood, but it really helps if we do. So I think, you know, as women, we should definitely affirm what other women say, stand up for other women. But isn't that because boys, I mean, from just looking at my two children's experiences, uh, my son is, in, is involved in a lot of team, competitive team sports. So he's mm -hmm. learned to be part of a group of, a gang of boys from very young. My mm -hmm. daughter doesn't quite have that yet. And I've been trying to get her into football and just to have the same experience that my, my son has. And it is much harder because girls are being driven to do things like ballet, not that ballet is not, mm. you know, it's not good, but they are all individual sports. They're, you know, they are individual things that you do. It's not team sports. So, and even me in my adult life, I can count the number of times if I were in part of four ladies and had this group of women around me who I can call on um, if I needed support, you, you're pretty much on your own most of the time. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at girls and boys growing up, girls tend to go around in pairs. They have a best friend, whereas boys tend to go around in gangs. And I don't know to what extent that's from team sports, though I suppose that helps to create a sense of sort of ganghood. Um, but <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that is certainly true. I mean, they do socialise differently. And another thing that comes from childhood, I think, is that if you look at boys um, interacting together, it tends to their interactions tend to be a sort of competitive boastfulness. So, you know, it's, oh, my dad's got a better car than yours or I've scored more goals than you this season. And, and, and that's how they sort of rub along together. With girls, it's exactly the opposite. It's almost competitive self-deprecation. So it's, oh, I'm useless at maths. Oh, I hate my hair. Oh, my bum's too big. And that's how they bond. And if a girl goes around being boastful the way that boys are, she's absolutely slapped down by the other girls and ostracized by them. And so we are trained to be the opposite of self-promoting, which means that in adulthood, men can go around saying how great they are to their managers and the managers will believe them, even if they're actually overestimating their ability and are more likely to promote them. 
Whereas women go around saying, oh, I'm not sure I'm ready for that challenge yet. And they may be more accurately assessing their ability, but or or they may actually be being modest and self-deprecating as they've been trained to do. And the managers therefore won't promote them. But again, it, if, if, if women start to act the same way as men, so if, if women start to self-promote, we really don't like that. So women will actually get punished for self-promoting in a way that men don't. So it, there are so many double binds here. I write about this a lot in my book. It's the same you, you sort of slightly mentioned earlier about confidence. So if, if a lot of books say, oh, women should just be more confident. They should be more assertive. They should lean in, you know, send women on assertiveness training courses and they'll be fine. No, if only it were that simple. Because actually, once we do start behaving as confidently and as assertively as men, uh, people recoil and they start to use words about us like, oh, she's quite strident or abrasive or aggressive or overbearing, bossy, you know, adjectives that are never used of men showing exactly the same character traits. And that's because we still have these really sneaky, old fashioned stereotypes lurking in our brains that say, as you said earlier, you know, women have got to be kind and gentle and warm and nurturing and unselfish and uncompetitive, whereas men have to be confident and assertive and dominant and show leadership. And yet the trouble is that if women only show those what are called communal traits, they're not going to get on. People aren't going to take them seriously. And once we start to show the so-called masculine traits of agency, you know, being confident and assertive, people don't like it. So, so then we have to so you ask me what we have to do. The, the only way through this, actually, is to layer oodles of warmth onto our personality to mitigate any of the sort of hostility that that acting like a man might produce, uh, which is both exhausting and often inauthentic. And, you know, we have to smile a lot and be incredibly nice to everybody and read the room very carefully and be very emotionally intelligent and not tread on any men's egos. You know, it's it's exhausting and men don't have to do this at all. Yeah, there's a side of me that wants women to do all that. But there's another side that just wants us to all just come in as we are um, and, and let people learn to deal with us as different, different people, because all women do not fall under one nurturing umbrella of warmth and, mm. and beauty and whatever the definition of beauty even is. We are all different. And I think. We, it's time we start to change that narrative and allow ourselves to show up exactly as we are. And, and some of us will have to pay the price, but hopefully what? that will make it a lot easier for the next generation coming after us because we can't keep tiptoeing around these issues and trying to make men feel more comfortable and, and be shying away from being called names. When is it going to stop? Well, I mean, I also think, you know, it's the same for men. You know, not all men are like the male stereotype and they shouldn't have to be either. I just say, let's just treat every individual we meet as an individual and stop judging them through this sort of warped template of, you know, outdated stereotypes. But I'm very reluctant to say to women, throw it all away, just be yourself, just be utterly authentic, because I don't want them to suffer in the workplace as a result. So, I mean, I think as we get more women into leadership positions, I mean, you certainly notice if you work in a, in a department or an organization where there are lots of women, it's much easier to be yourself, isn't it? Um, and so the more women we get into leadership positions, the more we can sort of drop this ridiculous carapace. But I think it's a at the moment we're in this transitional phase, I'm afraid, and maybe our generation has to act like this in order to allow m younger women to come through with more authenticity. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Yes, it, 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 it's sad, but at least we know what the data is saying. And once you have the data, you can work with the data to improve things. Yeah. So, Marianne, can you tell me about the competency versus confidence trick? Um, oh, yes. yes. So, I mean, this is at the heart of it. Um, because I think men do often carry more authority because they seem more confident. And there are lots of reasons why boys and men are encouraged to be more confident than girls and women. I mean, for a start, their parents believe in them more, they think they're cleverer, so they have more intellectual confidence. They are allowed to go around sort of swaggering and blustering in a way that women aren't. Have you ever heard of a swaggering woman? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, women have to deal with all the dents to their confidence that they get as a result of the behavior 
that arises from the authority gap. You know, if people are constantly questioning their authority, question, challenging their expertise, interrupting them, not allowing them to influence, influence a meeting, you know, um, patronizing them and underestimating them, of course, they're going to feel less confident and you get into this sort of vicious circle. But the trouble is that we tend to mistake confidence for competence. And so, as I sort of mentioned earlier, a manager is more likely to promote an overconfident man than an underconfident woman, even if the woman is actually more competent than the man. There is a fantastic book by a behavioral psychologist called Tommaso uh, Chamorro Pramusic. I'm sure you know it, called Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? <laughs> and what can we do about it? I love the title. And he does some fantastic TED Talks on this. I really, really recommend it. Um, because what he says is that the very characteristics that enable these men to become leaders are the same characteristics that make them bad leaders. Yeah. Because if you're overconfident uh, and you, uh, A, you're not, you know, you're not gonna be as good a leader because you're overestimating your own competence, but it also means you're less likely to listen to other people. You are likely to be quite arrogant. And he says what we need is, as leaders are people who are humble and have integrity. And he says these characteristics are more likely to be found in women than in men, actually. He says he's a sexist in, in favor of women because he actually thinks, you know, that he says the data show me that women make better leaders than men. And he's actually right. Um, oh yeah, I'm Griselda, you're, you're an expert on leadership, you know about this. But, you know, what's called transformational leadership, which is leadership which involves your employees more, engages them more, is less hierarchical and more democratic, is the most effective type of leadership. And it's also the type of leadership that is most often shown by women. Yeah. And that's the sort of leadership we've needed. Yeah. We've gone through the pandemic. Yeah. And haven't female leaders on the whole been a lot better than male ones yes. on average? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it would be great to live in a country run by a woman. Um, yeah. New Zealand and the others haven't suffered as much as we have here in the UK. And, yeah. you know, the chaos goes on. Yeah. <laughs> God knows when that's going to end. Yeah. Um, that he says the trouble is that we get we get sort of entranced by a certain type of charisma in these not all male leaders but these sort of very blustering comic male leaders i think you know who i'm talking about there's about four or five of them around at the moment and you know he says no one's going to make a biopic about angela merkel no. you know who just gets up in the morning reads her papers very diligently makes rational decisions never gets involved in any scandal because she's not interesting enough but she's a great leader, and that's the sort of leader we actually need. Yes, it, it's really shocking how, um, and again, it comes to the argument of introverted and extroverted people. You know, the extroverts are out there, they're speaking, they're, they're, they're loud, you can hear them, mm. you can see them before you even, you know, you walk into a room. And that's what we want. We seem to think that that's the best form of personality for leadership. And I think in your book as well, you looked at some of the leadership styles and and the qualities, the attributes that lead to effective leadership and why women are, are really great at that. And I, and I just wish that more women listening to this will, will I don't want to use the word lean in, um, you know, because it's tough leaning in, but will we'll just believe that they can lead, they have something to contribute mm. uh, because we need more empathetic, more, um, more collaborative leaders we need leaders who are more inclusive and leaders who want to lead everybody, not just people who look like themselves, because yeah. the world is going to be a much better place. And and so if you're a woman listening to this, you're, 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 you're with us live or you're listening to a recording of it and you've never thought of yourself as a leader, I strongly believe it's not about the title and, and it's not about the position. It's not about how much you earn. It's really you deciding that you have something to contribute and people feeling that, yes, actually, we want to follow this person because yeah. we like where she's going. And I just yeah. wish more of us will, will be open to that possibility for ourselves and not listen to all the narrative that leadership is, you know, the qualities are all for men and men do it better than us. Yeah, they just don't. I mean, huge meta studies have shown that if you ask employees to rate how good their leaders are, they will on average rate female leaders more highly than male leaders and managers as well. You know, female managers more highly than the, though the male managers rate themselves more highly than the female managers. 
So actually, I just say, look at the data and internalize that, you know, which is on the whole, we make very good managers and very good leaders. Fantastic. So, Marianne, writing this book, you said it's taken you a, a three years, over three years to write. You collaborated with so many people. The research is extensive. Um, and I am a strong believer that we, you know, it takes a, a village to do a project like this. And you've managed to interview some quite exceptional women. Now, I try and encourage women to reach out and to build a network around them. And I just wanted you to share how you've done this throughout your career and how these women have now come to be part of this research. Uh, yes, yeah, so I interviewed about 40 or 50 really successful, authoritative women, you know, former presidents and prime ministers, CEOs, bishops, generals, orchestral conductors, film directors, you know, huge range of women. Uh, but not just, I also interviewed about another 50 women who aren't in that category, because, you know, I didn't want it just to be sort of, you know, white corporate feminism. <laughs> um, but, 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 but you see, my idea was that if even these women have come across the authority gap, that is really good proof that the whole of womankind has. Because even if you get that senior and you still suffer from it, then that's pretty, that is pretty good proof. How did I do it? Well, I have spent 30 years as a journalist. And the, one of the great things being a journalist does is give you access to all sorts of important people. You just meet really interesting people in your life. Um, and, and I've kept up with them, <laughs> and uh, particularly the ones I liked, uh, and, and particularly the women, actually, because, you know, we often felt a sort of sisterly bond, I think, you know, both being in very male worlds. Uh, and, you know, we'd compare notes, whether it was female politicians or female CEOs or whatever. But also I have a very strong belief, and I say this to my children, I say one thing leads to another. So you meet one person, they introduce you to somebody else, for instance. So when I, so, I, you know, I made a list of the really interesting women I wanted to to interview for the book. And, and I thought, who can introduce me to this? How many degrees of separation am I from this woman? You know, so, you know, probably of those 40 or 50, about a third were women I already knew. But the other two thirds were, were actually friends of friends or, you know, contacts of people I'd already interviewed. Some of them I just wrote to blind and said, look, I'm ready talking to these women. Would you like to join the list? But most of them were via a personal recommendation. And I just think you have to be brave. And one of the things I always say to my children is, you know, if you meet someone really interesting at a party or whatever it is, follow it up, you know, email them and say, hey, why don't we have lunch? Um, because that's how you make new friends. And, and often they'll be really pleased. That. People really shy away from I know. Them. What, what, what am I going to say to this person? I mean, she's yeah. very busy. Why would she want to talk to me? Yeah, I know. Well, and, and I always say the worst that can happen is they say no. And then you're no worse off. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to you, I saw your book and I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. And I just reached out to you on LinkedIn. And, and there you go. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> expecting you to reply, but lo and behold, you did. Mm -hmm. um, so you're practicing what you're preaching as well, which yes. is fantastic. But I wanted to talk about some of the challenges you face in your career. And the one that stands out to me is the um, condition you have recognizing faces. Do you want to talk us through that and how you've managed to overcome that over the years? OK, yeah. So I suffer from something called prosopagnosia, uh, which is more commonly known as face blindness. And there's a little part of your brain somewhere above your right ear. It's here somewhere called the fusiform gyrus. And its only function is to be able to recognize human faces. And mine basically doesn't work very well. <laughs> and it's a it's a heritable condition. So my mother was the same. My grandfather was the same. One of my two daughters is the same. And what it means is I can, you know, I could meet you, Griselda, today and I could walk straight past you in the street tomorrow and not realize you are the same person. <laughs> so, I mean, for instance, I once um, I went to a conference and it was a sort of residential conference and I had breakfast with this guy. And then we went back to our rooms and then we went into the, you know, the conference center. Um, and so I was sitting in a seat in the conference center and a man comes up and sits next to me. So I smile and say, hello, I'm Marianne Seacott. He says, I know we've just had breakfast together. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, I know. Uh, so, yeah, it is quite a handicap. It was a terrible handicap when I was a lobby correspondent, a, a political correspondent. And so we get access to the lobby of the House of Commons where the MPs all mingle. And it's supposed to be incredibly useful because you can talk to all these politicians off the record. Yeah. 
Um, but I would walk in and I'd just be surrounded by this sea of men in grey suits. And I couldn't tell them apart. I had no idea who any of them were. <laughs> and, you know, they all knew who I was because at the time I was young and female and that was pretty rare in my job. So they'd come up to me and say, hi, Marianne, how are you? What do you think of Prime Minister's questions? And I'd think, I have no idea who you are. But I couldn't let on. <laughs> having to you know deal with that it, i think that's quite admirable um, well, especially being a journalist because you're dealing with different faces all the time you're writing about people and your stories and, and you have to recognize them so what would you say to anyone listening to this and thinking well i have a condition that makes it very difficult to do what i do so i might as well go and find something else to do oh i just persevere i think keep buggering on is my motto <laughs> <laughs> find a way around it you know I'm quite good at recognizing people by their voice by their hair as long as they don't change it I mean I love it when someone has very distinctive you know like a sort of wart on their on their cheek or something like that <laughs> ah yes that's him Robin Cook was very easy to recognize you know great massive ginger hair and a ginger beard um yeah I you just have to get around these things I think Yeah. Yeah. I've got a whole chapter. Well, I've, I've got all sort of sprinkled through as well intersectionality, because if it's bad for white women, the authority gap, it's even wider for black women, for women of color. Yeah. And I used to be really frustrated when I said things and, you know, got misquoted or wasn't recognized by people at events. And I thought, why am I, am I invisible? I've just been on stage talking and mm. half the room doesn't recognize me. So can you talk us through, the, what the data is telling us about that, because I know for a lot of people, we, you know, you're either thinking, oh my God, am I invisible in this room? Should I even bother? It's just too much work. Should I go and try somewhere else? What's the data telling us and what solace can we get from that so we can keep persevering? Yeah, I mean, the data shows that black women are, are much more often seen as sort of interchangeable. So your thing about not being recognized, I bet people mistake you for another black woman. Yes. Yeah uh they are what you say doesn't lodge in people's brains as much as a white woman that and a white woman's doesn't lodge in people's brains as much as a white man so you know all these things are magnified for for women of color then you have the problem that uh even if you do get promoted to a really great position which you have thoroughly deserved because of your brilliance people will say oh she's just a diversity hire and of course, women get that as well. Oh, she was only put on this board because she's a woman. But if she's a black woman, oh, well, she ticks two boxes, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you have the other problem of um, you get the racial stereotypes overlaid on the gender stereotypes. So, you know, if you make a fuss and say, hang on, you just interrupted me. Oh, she's an angry black woman. Yeah. And, you know, if you were Asian, it might be she's oh, she's a demure Asian woman, you know. Uh, so, yeah, life is doubly or perhaps trebly hard, I think, for women of colour. Women of disabilities to have a really big problem. And then 19 percent of women of working age um, and working class women, of course, um, find it harder to be taken seriously than middle class women. So, you know, I could have written this book about race and I could have written it about class, but I'm not the right person to write those books because I'm white and I'm middle class. But, you know, all, all these things exacerbate the authority gap, I'm sorry to say. And, and um, the thing I find the most interesting is the challenge you get. You know, you're brought in to help a company do something because mm. clearly they've done their research and they've decided mm. that you're the one to help them. But the challenge of your ability and your competence. Yeah. So black women are much more likely even than white women to say that they have to prove their competence yeah. or that people are surprised at their ability. Yeah. And it's so annoying, this surprise, isn't it? It's so insulting. I, I used to find when I was working at the Times and I had, you know, a senior editorial position there. I was an, I was an assistant editor and a columnist. And so often the conversation would go like this. I'd meet a man for the first time and he'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a journalist. And he'd go freelance. And I'd say, no, you know, start at the bottom, right? No, I'd say, I'm staff. Oh, he'd say. And uh, where do you work? Uh, the Times. Oh, he'd say. And if his voice would rise in pitch. At every, but you know, and what you do there, oh, you know, and 
And he probably thought he was flattering me, you know, Ooh, aren't you important? But actually, no, it was really insulting because the implication was, I thought you were going to be really junior and boring and now it turns out you're not. Yeah, but, you, you know, his been... default assumption was so low. So what can we do? Because that in itself is so wearing psychologically, yeah. emotionally, mentally. Mm. Um, and in I just cases, think you get penalized for calling her out. Because yeah, but I, th I think I think I think call it out in a sort of smiley way. That's what I've decided to do. As I get older, I mean, I will I, I will now say, oh, that's interesting. Would you do you think you'd have started the conversation the same way if I'd been a man? <laughs> Would you have asked if I was freelance? And, and I've often said that, actually. And the man has sort of stroked his chin and said, mm, maybe not. And then you can sort of laugh and say, look, we all suffer from this bias. Women do, too. Um, but let's think about it. Let's try not to do that sort of thing. You, you also did research looking at um, men who are transitioned to women and women who had transitioned to men and the experiences they had yeah. living both lives. Do you want to share a bit about that? Yeah, this I just found this so interesting because it's, you know, if, suppose you're a woman who's up for promotion and your male colleague at the same level gets the promotion and you don't. And you sort of have a suspicion that bias was at play but you can never prove it, can you? Because maybe he was better than you. So the best way to prove that the authority gap exists is to look at exactly the same person who is treated differently because of how their gender is perceived, right? So talk to people who've lived as both a man and as a woman. And when you do that, you have controlled for all the other variables because they're exactly the same person with the same ability and intelligence and personality and experience and all that. And the only thing that's changed is their gender. And if they're then treated differently, obviously the authority gap exists. So I start with the story of two Stanford professors who happened to transition in middle age in the opposite direction. And Ben Barris started living as a man. He's a neuroscientist. And once he started living as a man, he said, I've had the thought a million times, I'm taken more seriously now. Someone was overheard at the back of one of his seminars who didn't know his history, said, oh, Ben Barris gave a great seminar today, but then his work's so much better than his sister's. <laughs> I.e. his own work. Same person. Yeah, same person. Uh, Joan Rothgarden, an evolutionary biologist, transitioned in the opposite direction. She said when she was a young man and she had tenure, everything she said was listened to. Uh, she talked, people shut up. She was taken seriously. Her work was taken seriously. Once she transitioned and began living as a woman, all that changed. And she said, you know, I was interrupted. I was talked over. I was ignored. And to start with, I thought, well, if I'm going to live as a woman, I'm darn well going to be discriminated against like a woman. And she said, well, the thrill of that has worn off, I can tell you. <laughs> She yeah, said, after a while. yeah, and she said, you know, my basically, she said, my, my, my conclusion is that men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise. Yeah. And women are assumed to be incompetent until proven otherwise. And much bigger studies of trans men and women have drawn up exactly that have thrown up exactly the, the same evidence, the same phenomenon. Trans men in particular say it's fantastic once they start living as a man. They're just respected more. They're taken more seriously. People listen to what they say. They can get away with much more. That's another thing. You know, men can just get away, away with much more than women. If women make a mistake, it's absolutely pounced on. Men are allowed to fail and then just brush themselves off and, and start again. Yeah. I think we're, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to just now ask about, you know, your routine. I'm really passionate about how leaders like yourself, you know, show up the way you do, how you keep your mental health healthy and well. Um, can you just share a routine, your daily routine, if you have one? I, I hate routines. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't really have a routine. Um, I do so many different things. I have a sort of portfolio life. Yeah. And... I love that because every day is different. So I suppose I'm I'm not a very conservative person. I'm the opposite. Uh, I like variety in my life. I'm quite adventurous. Uh, so I don't have a routine at all. And, and and maybe some people would hate that, but it but it suits me very well. But it works for you. So when when do you find the time to write? Um, well, do you know the pandemic 
the first lockdown was fantastic for me because it almost exactly coincided with my, um, you know, the contract to write this book. And so I just got my head down every day because I had so few distractions and I just made myself write a thousand words a day. Unless I, unless I was trying to bring together all the research for a new chapter, I realized I had to write, um, I think to start with, it was 3000 words a week in order to, to get it done by the deadline. It slightly sped up towards the end <laughs> and I was working weekends as well as weekdays. Um, but I, I basically told myself I couldn't leave my study until I'd written a thousand words. And that, that was pretty helpful. And, and that sort of tallied with, I used to be a daily newspaper journalist and, you know, that was the sort of average length of a column. So I was used to, you know, I thought if I broke it down into these much smaller um, challenges, it would be easier for me to do than just feeling overwhelmed with the thought of how do I write 100,000 words. So what books have shaped you um, over the years? Is there any particular book that have really shaped your thinking? Oh, so many. That one I mentioned earlier by Thomas Chamorro Pramusic is fantastic. Really admire that. Um, I think my favourite novel recently has been Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. Yes, it's I given me that. such an insight into the lives of so many different black women. Um, uh, so I really love, I, 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 I feel, so I feel very strongly about the fact that men don't read books by women nearly as much as women read books by men. And I've got a whole chapter in this, but I also feel that, you know, as a white woman, just as I feel men ought to be reading books by women, white women ought to be reading books by black women. And we just expand our horizons, don't we? And I feel men live in such a sort of narrow world, really, if they're only reading books by men. <laughs> but that, that's why their, their, their biases are so strong and... Yeah, reinforced. Per pervasive. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marianne, for um, the past 45 minutes, for your time, for your insight. Uh, if you haven't got the book, the authority book, you can get your copy from Amazon and any other good bookstore. It um, looks like that. Uh, of course, that's backwards, isn't it? But anyway. <laughs> and, and try and get it for the men in your life as well, for your managers, for your manager's manager. I mean, let's get more men reading this book. Yeah. Because I think the data is um, will convince them that the bias we're dealing with is actually real. Mm. And if you want to connect with Marianne, I, I am connected with her on LinkedIn. She's quite active on there. You can connect with her and ask any questions that you want. Um, thank you so much for staying with us through the last 45 minutes as well uh, and for your engagement. If you're not already a, a member of Forward Ladies, I'll encourage you to head over to forwardladies.com to join and to use our 14-day free trial to access the membership and all the other fantastic interviews we have there. You can also subscribe to the podcast on um, on iTunes and Spotify and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And next time you're coming for our interviews, bring, bring someone from your team as well. So thank you so much and goodbye and see you soon. Thank you. It's been lovely.